But uh, for the next 20 minutes, what I want to do is talk with you about the ontology of claims. And what I'm going to share with you is a little bit novel and uh, a little bit maybe radical. So I think I should uh, qualify this by saying who I am. So I'm, the Travis, I'm Travis Spencer, CEO of Curity. I've been working with OAuth every single day since at least 2011. I've been building a product since 2015 that is the most technically complete OAuth and OpenID Connect server on the market. I have people in my team who have been doing this even longer than I have, and uh, we're, we're a pretty big team, all senior, uh, all working in this space. And what we arrived at, or what we saw after all these years, just uh, end of last year, was something that completely blew our mind, and that was uh, around claims. So I want to talk about what that is, but before I, I blow your brain with this revelation, I'd like to give you a demo to show you that this isn't uh, an abstract uh, idea or, or notion. So what I have here in this demonstration is an OAuth client. This is OAuth tools. If you've never heard about this, be sure and bookmark this. This is one of your key takeaways. It's a simple OAuth client that can do all sorts of different flows, code flow, decoding tokens, hybrid flow, uh, virtually all the flows. So this flow that I've set up here uh, is a code flow. I have a client ID. It's client uh, client one. I'm going to do the open ID scope uh, that I'm requesting there, and I'm going to prompt for consent and prompt for login so we can see something uh, when we redirect to the open ID Connect server. So it's it's a similar request to this. Uh, finally, when a real client, because this is like a teaching tool. I uh, would make here where I have my, my scopes, I have the, the prompt, uh, and now I'll do the flow. So here I log in as Teddy, and here I'm being prompted for some claim uh, to release to the client. Do you allow this, this client to, do, to, to have access to this data um, that, that you own? And in this case, it's just the user ID because the only scope that I requested was open ID. So I'll go ahead and grant this access. So now, to get to claims. It is defined in section five of the OpenID core specification that a OpenID Connect relying party or client can specify that it wants certain claims to be uh, asserted by the OpenID Connect server. So here I can, I can build one, I can ask for address, that's kind of a boring one. I'll ask for email actually, which is one that we're gonna see uh, a little bit later on. So in this, I have uh, two claim syncs. Uh, so I'm saying that I want the claims to be in the ID token. I want them to be in user info. Um, and I don't have any specific um, uh, requirements for the value of the email claim. And, and any value for the verified email is also OK. I can also add my own claims if I want to. I can say I want the claim foo. And this one, I want to have a value of bar and I want this one to end up in the ID token, uh, the user info, and the access token. So now that the JSON structure is extended, I now have foo. Uh, did I not type bar there? Uh, there, I have bar. So now I have a value that I'm requiring called uh, bar. And this is not a requirement like um, it's a it's a request. It's a query. I can I can say that my my needs are stronger by saying that it's essential. Uh, so the OpenID Connect server can see like okay that the client really needs to have access to this value in order to provide a smooth experience. And uh, here I've also specified that I need this this value of foo uh, or this claim of foo in the access token. So now if I close this little editor, what happens is the claims that I've specified end up in the claims request parameter that's passed to the authorized endpoint. Okay, So if I make this request now, what I'm going to see here after logging in is more claims have to be released now because the client application asked for additional information of the users to be released. Um, and the foo claim that I just made up is not even being shown here because the authorization server doesn't know what that is, so of course it can't assert it. So again, showing that this is a query, this is a preference. So even though we said foo is essential for a smooth experience of the resource owner at this client, since the authorization server doesn't know that, it can't assert that, so the user doesn't have to release it. So now when I actually do this releasing of the information, I get an ID token, and when we look inside of this ID token, uh, we're going to see those claims that were actually uh, requested. 
Okay, so this is not just a, an abstract thing. Uh, this is uh, part of the core specification of OpenID. So what are claims? A claim is something asserted by someone or something else. So it's, it's like Jakob's example yesterday of um, Jacob has a horse, Travis says. So there's a, there is a subject, Jacob, there is an asserting party, me, and there's a claim that he has a horse. Okay, so uh, it's a statement about some subject, some particular entity, user often, uh, that is being asserted or, or claimed to be true by some party, an asserting party. And the claim is only trustworthy if you trust that asserting party. So it doesn't mean that it's an actual truth necessarily. It depends on how much you trust that asserting party. In, op in OpenID Connect and OAuth, the asserting party is the authorization server. Uh, the subject is the resource owner. And the API uh, or the client are the relying party. And it could vary there depending on the claim sync where those uh, claims will be asserted. And what, by that, I mean if the claims end up in user info or in the ID token, uh, the relying party will be the client. And if it ends up in the access token, then the relying party will be the API. OK? So here's the, the mind-blowing revelation, and that is that there are no scopes. OK? We hear about this idea of scopes in OAuth, and we're all super confused, and we kind of think we understand them, and that doesn't match how you understand them, and it doesn't match how I understand them. And then I just realized one day, and we all <laughs> realized as a team, there are no scopes. What is this guy talking about? Scopes are a brand new thing in OAuth 2. They never existed, not even in OAuth 1.0. They did not exist in any specification that I have ever heard of beforehand. If you sort of squint at HTTP, you can see the idea of scope in HTTP basic authentication, but it's all about scope of access. Okay, In OAuth uh, 2, there is a uh, A, B, and F defined for scope value, or scope token. And in OpenID Connect, it talks about scope value. And what those are are the values in the space-separated list of the scope request parameter. So the only thing that is actually talked about in, in, in OAuth 2, and by extension OpenID, is scope of access. So all the time when we say scopes, we're say, we're, it's wrong. Really what we mean is scope values or scope tokens the things in that space-separated list. So uh, all that this is about in that space-separated list is the total extent of scope of access that is being granted by that token when presented to a resource server. So how does this relate to claims? Does it relate to claims? So scopes are a group of claims. They're a little macro, a little shorthand, that makes it possible for you to request the scope of access without having to make that claims request parameter with that egregious JSON object. It's, it's a simple way for clients who have simpler needs of obtaining a scope of access to get it from the OpenID Connect server. It's insufficient for complex queries. That stuff we just did in the demo, you cannot do that with the scope request parameter. Impossible. The only standard grouping of these claims into this scope container is from OpenID Connect. And I'll show you that. And of course, we support that in our product to do arbitrary scoping. So here's an example. We have the profile scope, which we all know and love. And uh, so that's one scope, and that is profile. And that consists of a dozen or so claim names. And then when some user logs in, uh, the values for those claims, if, uh, if the uh, OpenID Connect server can assert them, uh, will be asserted as claim values. Okay, so this is how that grouping takes place. Instead of having to ask for all of those dozen or so different claims, I can simply ask for one scope. That's why I call it like a macro or shorthand. And it works like this for all scopes defined in OpenID Connect. So we have the profile one, we have OpenID as a scope, which there you saw the user had to release uh, to the client access to their user ID. 
Uh, there's also some system claims that the, the OpenID scope also uh, grants. Offline access is another scope in OpenID, which has no claims, so it's an empty group. We have email, which we just looked at, uh, which has two claims. So remember this one, because I'm going to come back to this one at the end. So if this is new to you, there's a scope called email. Confusingly, it has a claim called email, but it also has another claim called email verified. And there's address and phone. Okay? So wouldn't this be great if we could make our own containers of claims? If we could make a scope called, say, product two, and in that, we could, that scope, we could put different claims like claim one and claim two. And so that when a user is logging in uh, and being authenticated and releasing their data for claim one and claim two, we could put that into an ID token, user info, or an access token. So those claim values uh, would end up manifesting themselves. How is this useful? So there is less to consent to. Right? So if I ask for profile scope, if you can imagine, then you would have to um, actually see all of those in the profile scope as data which uh, the user wants to have access to and that, or the, the client wants access to. And that could be quite overwhelming for the user to have to approve all of those. So instead of making a large request, which will be even larger, by the way, if we're requesting not just profile, but address and email and uh, our custom scope of product two, the, the user will be overwhelmed by that. So we can ask for less information to be released. So claims provides a way of reducing the cognitive load on the user as they're doing that authorization. Uh, by, by reducing it just to what's needed for the current transaction or the, the next set of transactions. We can upgrade that by making another request with another claims request parameter that has maybe the next set of claims that now you need as you're using the application more. Uh, and then in that case, they would have to release that data. Uh, and this gives us sort of like a progressive authorization of the application. So th that's one usefulness. The other is that less data is released. Right? We're all becoming more uh, concerned around the privacy of the end user, uh, especially here in Europe and in California, where we're having laws that actually require us to be um, using as, as little data and for an exact purpose for a shorter uh, amount of time or for the uh, specific amount of time. Um, so we're, we're thinking more about privacy. So another usefulness of claims is that we, we only release what we need to uh, when we need to release it. So if we asked again for a profile, we might be releasing more information than was necessary. Okay? So then the other important part, which really is the, the mind bending or the, the spoon bending uh, one, is that um, we can do finer grained authorization. So because we can look at the, the claims and the claim names and the claim values, uh, all of the authorization that we're doing in the APIs becomes moot. Like we don't even need the scope anymore once everything becomes claims aware. And that's why I say there, that another reason that I say there, there are no scopes. OK, so what do I mean by this? Let's look at authorization because this is one of the most uh, compelling usefulnesses or use cases uh, for claims. So remember that email. Uh, claim or that email scope, it represents two claims. So instead of the application, uh, here my little server icon, uh, having to ask for both of those claims, it just sends one scope, email. Very simple, very easy request, right? Love it. What that's essentially saying is, I want the end user to release the email claim and the email verified claim. So now user logs in like we just did, like with Teddy, and it's going to be prompted for the user ID, because we're uh, perhaps asking for the open ID uh, scope, but also asking to release email and email verified. And now imagine that that user says, great, uh, end application, they can have my email, but not my verified email. So when the redirect happens back to the client, the only claim that is uh, authorized is the email claim, which means that the whole group of, of claims isn't, uh, isn't authorized by the end user. So the scope of email is not there, only the one of the constituent parts. 
Does that make sense? So if we're looking at the group, we don't have the full group. We only have one part of it. So what we can do is we can make a finer grained authorization decision by looking at the claim names instead of looking at the scopes. Okay? If that was confusing, let me try to illustrate it in another way because I think it's really important. So imagine we have scopes A, B, and C. Okay? And those are three buckets or three containers. And in, in the scope A, we have four claims, A1, A2, A3, and A4. Okay? And now imagine for, for B, likewise, we have one claim, uh, B1. And for uh, the, the scope C, we have two claims, uh, C1 and C2. Easy. Now, imagine that all of those claims are authorized by the end user. Then, when we're calling an API or looking in the client and making an authorization decision. So ultimately, the decision to release the data lies at the resource server. So it needs to decide, should I allow access or not? So in order to do that, suppose that the, what will authorize you access is if you have the claim C1. Okay? So when the user authorizes uh, all of those claims, then, of course, the application in that token has the C1 claim. So access is allowed whether it looks at scopes or looks at claims. But now imagine a case similar where we have the same scopes, we have the same claims, but the user only grants access to A1, A2, and A4. So they don't allow A3, similar to what we did with the email verified. I don't want the application to have access to my verified email. So in this case, if we're looking at the scopes, we don't have at all the A scope, capital A scope. We just have the, the capital B and capital C scope. But if we look at the claims, we see, look, we have A1, A2, and A4. And all that is needed to authorize this request is that you have the A1 claim. So this is what I mean when I say that you can make a, a more fine-grained authorization decision. So, and this is also why scopes become irrelevant. Because once we look at the scope names and or the scope values, we don't even need to pay attention to the scopes anymore. And see, even I say it, scopes anymore. What I mean is the scope values or the scope tokens. OK. So in summary, claims are an assertion made by some party about another. The authorization server, the OpenID Connect server, uh, when it's supporting OpenID, uh, is the asserting party. It's the one who can say something about the end user, the resource owner, which makes that entity the subject. And the client or the API or both will be the relying party that will rely on those assertions. Scopes are a group of claims. It's a somewhat controversial comment, perhaps, but that's, that's what, what we've learned them to be. Uh, and with claims, less data is released. So this is a better way of doing it because it's more private by design. Uh, it does mean for more complicated queries that the client might have to do when it wants to specify certain claim values or claim names as being something that it wants to assert. But we still always have the, the scope uh, macro or shorthand for keeping those clients simple. And claims provide a finer grained authorization mechanism that we can use. Thank you very much. <laughs>